Welcome to this week's edition of Fair Territory. There is only one thing to talk about. It's the thing we've been talking about for, I don't know, years now. And of course, on Saturday, it all came to fruition. The Shohei Otani contract, the terms, the team, the whole shebang. The team wasn't really that surprising, although after Friday's shenanigans, it might have been a little surprising. That was the Dodgers. The terms, though, oh, they were surprising. 10 years, $700 million. That's $70 million per season if you're keeping score. And the reason the term was surprising is because we had all thought when he underwent that second elbow surgery in five years that it would diminish his value somewhat. Now, I wrote at the time, he's still going to get $500 million. A bunch of readers told me I was full of it. They were right. I missed by $200 million. But in reality, this deal is not $700 million, at least in present day value, and at least more importantly, when it comes to luxury tax calculations. The deal includes deferrals, massive deferrals. I want to show you what I tweeted on Saturday and a number of others picked up on as well. We were told this by a source. Otani's deal with the Dodgers includes unprecedented deferrals, the majority of his salary. The deferrals were Otani's idea to ease the Dodgers' luxury tax and cash flow burdens to give the team flexibility to be as competitive as possible, according to the source. Now, maybe the deferrals were Otani's idea, but let me tell you something. Andrew Friedman, president of baseball operations for the Los Angeles Dodgers, loves nothing better than deferrals. Go look at the Mookie Betts contract to see what I'm talking about. So, present day value, we're expecting that the deal will be between $40 and $50 million a year, again, in present day numbers, and that's the number that you will see for the luxury tax calculation as well. Of course, it's a big number. And I expect his salaries over the initial years of the deal to be rather low. And I expect a massive signing bonus and then, of course, a ton of money coming to him later. That is what he is talking about there, or the source is talking about, in terms of the cash flow. It will give the Dodgers the ability to do more things than they would have if they were simply paying Otani $70 million a year. So for the Dodgers, obviously, this is a huge move. For 2024, well, it is an offensive move, a move to help their run production, which didn't really need more help, considering that last year, the Dodgers scored 906 runs, the most by any team in Los Angeles Dodgers history. Brooklyn Dodgers had a few years in which they scored more, but for the Los Angeles Dodgers, this was the record, and now they get even better. Otani replaces J.D. Martinez, and obviously Otani is one of the top offensive players in the game. From a pitching standpoint, well, the Dodgers are going to have to wait. Otani will not be ready to pitch again until 2025, coming off that surgery that cannot be named. And even then, we don't know how many innings he'll be able to provide. And from that perspective and that point on, how long he'll be able to pitch and pitch effectively. So the Dodgers now are in quite an interesting position. Let's take a look at their rotation, the state of their rotation as we sit here on Sunday night. With the Otani deal still not official, but we're sitting here looking at this group. Walker Bueller, Bobby Miller, Ryan Pepio, Ryan Yarbrough, and some combination of Emmett Sheehan and Gavin Stone. Of course, that's subject to change based on spring training performance, health, and most importantly, who the Dodgers get next. They've been in talks for Tyler Glass now. I can see them pivoting to perhaps Dylan Cease if that comes available to them. Corbin Burns might also be available, but Glass now seems to be the one that they've been focused on of late. Trade talks are fluid. They can shift at any point. But I would expect that they're going to make a trade for one and then at least go to get some free agent. Now, you've heard them link to Yamamoto even after the Otani news was announced. I can see that, but man, the Dodgers don't often play at the top of the market. And this time they're doing it once at least with Otani. Are they going to do it twice with Yamamoto when you've got the Mets, the Yankees, the Giants, and all these other teams involved? I'd be surprised. But you still have Blake Snell out there. You still have Jordan Montgomery out there, Lucas Giolito, any number of others. They're going to figure it out. They're going to be fine. Now, to close out this segment, I want to talk about what I wrote after the terms were announced, after the choice of team was announced as well. And essentially, I wrote a column saying that this was good for the game that baseball will benefit from this, that overall, this is a positive. 
Fans did not react well to that, or at least the ones who responded in the reader comments. I'm accustomed to that. That's fine. Everyone is entitled to their opinion. But I want to take you through exactly what I was thinking. And I wrote that column knowing that fans of certain teams, small market teams in particular, would hate what I was saying. Payroll disparity in this sport is a historic problem. It has not ever been solved and probably never will be solved. It wouldn't even be solved necessarily by a salary cap, and we'll go into that in a second. The game's economics are based on locally generated revenue, not national television revenue like the NFL. It's a different kind of animal. And for the better part of a half century now, since the creation of free agency, fans have screamed for a salary cap. Now, it's not going to happen. The baseball union has held strong on this. They are never going to allow it. For them, it is the absolute line that cannot be crossed. But for all the complaints about the disparity in payrolls, we don't necessarily see disparity in competition the way some fans might think. Now, if you're sitting there in Pittsburgh or some other cities, Oakland would be obviously one now, you're saying to me, whoa, Ken, what are you talking about? But let me show you something right here. Let's go to what we've seen in Major League Baseball since the year 2000. No repeat champions. Only the Red Sox, Giants, and Cardinals have won multiple titles. And we've seen 16 different World Series champions. 16. Now let's look at the other sports, the salary cap sports that fans seem to long for in this sport. Franchises with titles since 2000. Major League Baseball, 16 the NFL 13, the NHL 13, the NBA 11. So if you're telling me that there's great competitive balance in these leagues, no, it's simply not happening. And frankly, in our sport, in baseball, we have seen low revenue teams succeed and succeed over multiple years. Now it's difficult to sustain, there's no question about it. And that's really where you see the difference. The Dodgers can sustain it. To some extent, other teams can sustain it too, but Oakland and Tampa Bay and Milwaukee, the teams that were successful for a period of time, Tampa Bay and Milwaukee still fit in this category. It's harder for them. Kansas City was successful for a time. Cleveland. And now Baltimore is coming on, as well as Arizona. The Orioles last year won the AL East with the second lowest payroll in the major leagues. The Diamondbacks, with the 10th lowest payroll, made it to the World Series. Meanwhile, the Mets, Yankees, and Padres all underachieved and underachieved dramatically. So obviously, yes, there are differences in the way teams go about it because of the money that they generate, because of their locally based revenue. But the sport, the attendance last year for all the people who tell me the sport is broken was up. The new rules are having a positive effect. People are enjoying the game again. And the expanded playoffs that I'm not necessarily in love with, but the expanded playoffs have actually worked to enhance competitive balance to a degree. Not necessarily, of course, in the teams that get in. But once the teams get in, it's more random. And we saw that last year. The Diamondbacks knocked off the Phillies. They knocked off the Dodgers. And for that reason, those teams that get in, the low-revenue teams that can figure it out, they've got maybe a better chance than they did under the old system. Is this perfect? It's not even close to perfect. I'm not going to pretend it's perfect. It would be foolish to say anything like that. But don't tell me the sport is broken. I can see why in certain cities people feel that way. But overall, from the global perspective of this, the game is in a good place, and the game is in a good place with Shohei Otani in Los Angeles for the reasons I wrote. Time now for the inside dish. This is the segment in which I go maybe inside a story I've written, inside a trend in the game. And this week, it would seem to me that there is no way to get around talking about what happened on Friday with regard to the reporting about Shohei Otani's whereabouts and what he was doing with regard to his choice of team. There was a report by J.P. Hornstra on Dodgers Nation saying that Otani had chosen his team and that it was the Blue Jays. And there was a report by John Morosi saying that Otani was on a flight from Orange County to Toronto, presumably to either close the deal or I don't know, whatever it might have been. But it should have been a good sign if he was indeed on that flight for the Blue Jays. Obviously, both reports were proven to be inaccurate. And what happened was embarrassing. It was a poor reflection on our industry. 
it was whatever you want to call it. You would be justified in being upset as a fan. I want to preface what I'm about to say with a few things. One, I'm friends with John Morosi. I worked with him at Fox. He is a great guy and he is someone that has really come a long way in the business. We were at foxsports.com together for a number of years. I don't know J.P. Hornstra as well. I know him, but not as well. And the other thing I want to say before I get into this, we all make mistakes in our jobs. You make them. I make them. No one is perfect. Now, I'm not saying that to excuse what happened. There's no excuse for what happened. There's no question about that. It should never happen. But this is the kind of thing that occasionally happens in the Twitter era. Fans want information in real time. Reporters are trying to give them information in real time. Everything gets sped up. And it leads, frankly, to more sloppiness than existed in the days before the internet when we were, well, most of us were just writing for newspapers that came out the next day. Now, I've talked about my worst mistake, reporting that the Padres were close to getting Max Scherzer at the 2021 deadline. I have since learned that I got played by one source and that I placed too much value in the words of another. It was not excusable. I have to own it. I have to live with it. And to this day, it haunts me and it will always haunt me. I am not happy about what happened. Shouldn't have happened. It was bad judgment on my part. But in this day and age, there are very few of us who haven't been caught in the same situation. And yes, the bigger the stakes, the more careful you should be. Anything you want to say along those lines, I'm good with. You're right. The question people have often is, what is the value in being first on Twitter? And honestly, I'm not so sure anymore. I don't know that I was ever so sure. Most transactions can be confirmed in a matter of minutes. I don't know anyone who remembers who breaks what, who's keeping score out there. And I've said on various platforms, now I've said it on this show and other places as well, my goal, at least in the last couple of years, is not so much to break stories on Twitter. It's to write stories that cannot be confirmed in a matter of minutes. Stories that really people can't touch. Obviously, the most outstanding example of this in my career was the story I wrote with Evan Drellick about the Astros sign stealing scandal. Couldn't make a phone call and say, hey, can you confirm this? No, there was too much to it. And even the story I wrote last week, the one about Otani being in Dunedin, Florida at the Blue Jays Spring Training Complex, writing that he was believed to be there, that qualified as well. That could not be confirmed so easily. In fact, I don't know that it's been confirmed yet. So, when you look at the whole picture here, in some ways, I should be the last person to complain about Twitter. In many ways, Twitter raised my profile to a place where it hadn't been previously, even though I was at Fox on television. But in recent years, the length that baseball writers will go to to get scoops has changed. Reporting is built on relationships. But the question now often becomes, how far are you willing to go to maintain access to get information. Now, I get amused when I see people commenting on my stories, my columns, as they did after the Otani column, after he signed, saying, Ken, you're a shill, you're a bootlicker, you're this, you're that, the other thing. Guys, MLB Network declined to bring me back in 2022 because I was none of those things. There are two prominent agents right now who won't talk to me because I am none of those things. And there were two other prominent agents who went, I don't know, about a year, maybe a year and a half without talking to me because I am none of those things. It's just the way it is. If you're going to report, you're going to upset people. You're going to upset fans from time to time. Things happen. That's the nature of journalism. The nature of journalism, the intent, is not simply to be nice to people so they will give you information. And that, to me, has been something that has been going on for a while now. Now, the choices I've made, they've hurt me in some ways. There's no question about it. And I've had to live with that. And I'm not going to sit here on my high horse and tell you I'm the greatest. Like I said earlier, I am not perfect. It's a hard game, man. It's a hard game to be right all the time. It's a hard game simply to just go day by day and grind it out. But I've concluded over the years 
that journalism has to come first. That's what we're here to do. And the speed is important. The quickness of reporting something. No one can deny it. People want that. And you guys out there telling me we don't care? No, you can't. That's why you're on Twitter in the first place. But as much as speed might be important, accuracy and honesty are more important, and they always will be. Time now for Dude and Dork of the Week. Now, the Dude of the Week, quite obviously, for many people, is going to be Shohei Otani. How could it not be? $700 million for a guy that has just transcended our sport. But I'm going to name Dude of the Week a guy who spoke his mind last week, had the audacity to say that Shohei Otani was the Dodgers' top priority, had the gumption to say the Dodgers had met with Shohei Otani and for several hours. I'm talking, of course, about Dodgers manager Dave Roberts, who broke what was this supposedly unwritten rule about talking in any sense about the Shohei Otani negotiations. And you saw the Dodgers brass react kind of negatively to this, or at least say, we didn't authorize these comments or something along those lines. I don't even remember. It was ridiculous. Number one on the ridiculous scale was that teams were so afraid to talk when the reality was Shohei Otani was not going to refuse to sign a contract because you had mentioned his name. Shohei, he who must not be named. Dave Roberts said very normal things. Everyone in the world knew that they had to have a meeting with Otani. Everyone knew he was the Dodgers' top priority. So what Dave Roberts did was not wrong. He was actually the one guy in this process who spoke his mind, who told the truth. Dave Roberts, due to the week. Dork of the week, the deal was not even official. The deal had not even been announced when the Angels started tearing down Shohei Otani's mural at Angel Stadium. Who knows? He might flunk the physical. Maybe he'll be back in play for the Angels. All right, not likely. But Sam Blum from The Athletic did one of the more enterprising things in recent memory for me. Clever. Goes out to Angel Stadium just to take a look around. What's going on here? And boom! This is Saturday afternoon, shortly after the signing is announced. The mural is coming down. Sam took a couple of photos. He's a photographer as well as an excellent writer. And the Angels, my goodness. Shohei Otani gave you a lot. Now, I know the mural has to come down, of course. I don't know that it needed to come down within, I don't know, a couple of hours of the announcement. The Angels, from the beginning, they handled Otani well in many ways. They enabled him to become the player he is and the $700 million man. But my goodness, they could have waited until the dark of the night to paint that mural. They could have waited, I don't know, a day or two until the announcement, the official announcement. But no, the Angels had to wipe him away from history. Well, not exactly, but they had to wipe him off their walls. Angels, dorks of the week. Time now for Grilling Ken. Let's get to your questions. Are the Giants really serious about getting Yamamoto after not being a finalist for Otani? Yes, I would expect the Giants are really serious, Gustavo, who asked the question. And what's interesting now is to see how many teams will be on tilt as the offseason progresses. And what I mean by that is how many teams will become increasingly desperate or increasingly urgent in the way they attack this. The Giants, in not getting Otani, struck out on yet another superstar. Wasn't necessarily a surprise, but that is the reality. They want somebody to be their franchise guy. Ideally, it would have been Otani. The history would have been kind of cool. Willie Mays, to Barry Bonds, to Buster Posey, to Otani. Didn't happen. I don't know that Yamamoto is the same kind of force for them. 25-year-old, great pitcher, I get it. But who else is out there? Cody Bellinger is not going to do it in that sense. He's a good player. Matt Chapman, same thing. So the Giants are going to need to do some things to improve their team and to get that face of the franchise that they've been trying to get for so many years now. And I don't know how exactly it's going to go down. And I'll tell you another team that's going to be on tilt as well. If you remember a few days before the Otani signing, while we were at the winter meetings, I wrote a story with Caitlin McGrath about the Blue Jays. And why suddenly... They were in on Otani, in on Juan Soto. Hasn't really been their style. Well, the Jays have $300 million in ballpark renovations to justify premium seating to sell. They, too, need a big-time offseason. And the two biggest names are gone. So as this thing evolves and the dynamics change, 
it's going to be really interesting to see the Giants and to see the Jays and how they react. For the Giants and Yamamoto, it's going to be difficult for them. The Mets are in, the Yankees are in, the Dodgers supposedly are in, the Red Sox might be in. Every big spender you can think of wants a shot at this guy. It makes it all the more challenging for San Francisco. All right, on to the next question. Let's see what we got. This one comes from Devin Nolan, who asked, Hey, Ken, how do you personally feel this deal with Otani is going to affect the market for Juan Soto, considering he is five years younger, his agent is Scott Boris? Do you believe this means his floor is somewhere in the $600 million range? Devin, great question. And if you recall, Juan Soto rejected $440 million over 15 years from the Nationals. And at the time, a lot of people thought, hey, he's not getting that in the open market. Nope, he's getting that. He is getting almost certainly at least 500, and I don't know that 600 is out of the question. Now, again, these things are valued differently. The Otani deal, the number, the shiny object is 700 million, but the reality of it is in present day value, maybe it's 500 million or 550. Well, we don't know yet. We have not heard the official terms. If Soto gets a $550 million deal with no deferrals, it might actually be worth more in present day value than Otani's deal. But yes, I expect him to do well. Now, one caveat with Soto. He has declined in his base running and defense. Now, we know he is a historic offensive player, one of the great offensive players of this generation. He's on a Hall of Fame track. All that is true. But if he can get into better shape, or at least improve his performance defensively and with base running, in my opinion, he'll be that much more valuable. And I expect that with the Yankees, he's going to be extremely motivated and is going to want to kind of reestablish himself in the other parts of the game. In the batter's box, there's really no one like him. So we'll see how it goes for Juan, but I expect it's going to go pretty well. All right, final question. Here we go. This one comes from Robert. When was the last time you paid to get into a ball game? Now, Robert, I know exactly where you're going with this. The fact of the matter is that most of the games I attend, I am working at. But there are times that I will go as a fan. Now, last year I did not. But in 2022, I did. Let's get the picture up for photographic proof, evidence. That's me. That's my sister. That's my nephew. Oh, and by the way, we're in the upper deck at Yankee Stadium. Yeah, Mr. Media Elite in the upper deck. Got my tickets on StubHub. I don't even remember what they cost. But yes, I will go to a game on occasion with family members just to sit in the stands. So what you're getting at, Robert, is that I can't understand perhaps the plight of the true fan. You're not saying that. I'm kind of surmising it. Uh, I get it. And yes, of course, I get that it's difficult to afford a major league ball game for a family of four. We all know that. But guess what? On another level here, ticket prices are not contingent on salaries. Ticket prices are based on supply and demand. It is that way. It has always been that way, and it always will be that way. But to answer your question, yes, I go to games as a fan on a rare off night. Yes, I will pay for tickets. Yes, I am out there in the crowd. In fact, that night, people were asking me at Yankee Stadium, what the heck are you doing up here with us? Actually, I like it up there. All right, that's the answer. Thanks to everyone for listening, for watching, and of course, for your questions as well. You know where to find us? YouTube, Apple, Spotify, like us, subscribe to us. We'll be back next week from, I will have to say, parts unknown. Stay with us. Hey, get in on the action with the FT fam at BetMGM. New customers use the bonus code FOUL, F-O-U-L, for a $1,500 first bet offer. Download the BetMGM Sportsbook app on iOS or Android or visit BetMGM.com. Sign up and deposit at least $10 into your BetMGM Sportsbook account. Place your first wager and receive up to $1,500 back in bonus bets if the bet loses. If that bet does lose, your bonus bets will be available once your initial wager is settled. Gambling problem or concern? Call 1-800-GAMBLING.